Oi. Full disclosure, I used to run your macroeconomics blog, Monitor. We've known each other for many years. It's a great pleasure to be here with Dr. Nuriel Rubini. I have a pleasure being here with you today. Most of our viewers will already know you from your incredible call in 2006 at the IMF conference in September, predicting the great financial crisis effectively. And not just predicting the crisis, but predicting the specific mechanisms that were going to trigger that crisis. You talked about mortgage defaults, the problems with you know the securities that were built around those mortgages. But you've actually been very constructive for many years since the crisis uh, on U.S. equities. Could you tell us a little bit about how you thought about the recovery and how you've gotten to kind of where we are right now? Well, yeah, the recovery after the global financial crisis was bumpy. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it was a U-shaped recovery. It was not your typical V-shaped recovery because this was not a regular recession. It was a recession caused by financial crisis and a financial crisis was caused initially by too much uh, debt uh, in the private sector and then a build up of public debt. And as we know, whenever you have a financial crisis, you have a painful process of deleveraging and for a while you have to spend less, save more in order to reduce uh, that ratio over time and that great deleveraging implied that the recovery was anemic and was bumpy in many ways. Uh, but there's been a recovery that in the US has lasted over 10 years now the longest U.S. Uh, economic recovery. And in the rest of the world, the uh, recovery was stronger in emerging markets. Then there were shocks to emerging markets. Europe was more fragile. It was a double deep recession in some parts of Europe, even a triple deep recession. Mm. But I would say for financial market, what has happened has been that for the last decades, there have been a, a number of uh, risk-off episodes. Um, and these risk-off episodes were triggered by a variety of factors. Uh, concerns about uh, the Eurozone, concerns about the hard landing in China, concerns about what the Fed does, concerns about oil prices, and you name it. Mm. But in each one of these episodes, uh, that correction, say, correction of 10% plus in US and global equity has been followed by a recovery and then going to higher highs. My explanation of it is that, one, those concerns that the world economy is going to end up into another recession turn out to be wrong. Uh, growth recovered. And yes. secondly, in each one of these risk off episodes, uh, the policy reaction of central bank has been to ease more in a conventional and or unconventional way. And therefore, whether it was the Fed, the ECB, the BOJ, the BOE, the PBOC, central banks have come to the rescue of economies and markets. So some of those tail risks turn out to be less severe right. than thought and the central bank came to helping economies and markets, and therefore we've had the sustained recovery of asset prices that now has lasted for 10 years. Right, and that brings us to U.S. equity markets, and uh, U.S. equity markets have obviously, we're sitting here in December of 2019, have had a very good year. Could you talk a little bit about how you view that in the context of the broader macroeconomic framework? Yes, I mean, uh, I would say that to think ahead about uh, what's gonna happen to U.S. and even global equities, one is first to start with what's going to be the economic, uh, you know, outlook uh, for next year and so on. And as you know, uh, we're in the middle of what's called the synchronized economic slowdown, mm. a slowdown uh, that implies that growth is still positive, but is slower than before. You know, global growth uh, two years ago was 3.8 percent. Uh, last year was 3.4. This year, the MF estimate is going to be only 3 percent. In spite of that slowdown in growth, uh, this year. U.S. equities have turned out to do very well, uh, in part because uh, some of the tail risks that people are worried about uh, during the year, where there was a risk of a full-scale trade war between U.S. and China, or a hard Brexit, or a war between uh, U.S. and Iran in the Middle East, those risks have turned out to be milder than previously expected, first point. And secondly, again, the Fed, the ECB, and other central banks, uh, once they were this kind of a global headwinds, came to the rescue of the markets. So the year had started with Q4 last year was very bad, but then given the change in stance of the Fed and the central bank and the attenuation of this tail risk, uh, the, the market has done so far very well. Now, the, the first question probably you have to ask yourself is what's gonna happen to the global economy next year because that affects then uh, markets and policies. That was uh, my next question. Yeah, yeah, so in order to, to speak about US equities, probably we have to start with the real economy. I would say there are three scenarios. Uh, scenario number one is the more optimistic one, is the one that is being pushed by a number of, uh, say, sales-side firms mm -hmm. on Wall Street that says we had uh, 
a slowdown, but now some of these trail risks are disappearing. Financial condition have eased because of what the Fed, ECB, and other central banks have done. Mm. So we're going to go back to an economic expansion, not very robust. So instead of having 3% growth like this year, we're going to go back to 3.4. That is okay, but it's not as strong as it was in 2017, 3.8 for the global economy. And a slightly pick up in growth in US, in Europe, in Japan, and in um, other advanced economies. That's one scenario. Mm-hmm. And in that scenario, in spite of the pickup in growth, the argument goes that uh, inflation is going to maintain because there are global forces that keep wage inflation and price inflation low. And therefore, central banks with ease are going to stay on hold. And that might be an ideal scenario for US and global equities. Uh, you get, uh, you know, reflation trade, you get a pickup in growth, earnings keep on doing well, and monetary policy remain accommodative. And then, you know, US and global equity could have. Uh, say, something close to double-digit returns, in spite of valuation being very high. Right. That's one scenario. I'm skeptical of it for a few reasons. Second scenario... What are your skeptical uh, points when you think about that? Well, you know, my, my view of the world today is that rather than that scenario, we may have a continuation of this global slowdown, mm. where growth next year is going to be, say, slightly above 3%, but not as strong as 34 and it's going to remain at current levels in the US, in Europe, and other advanced economy. Maybe slightly pick up in growth in some emerging market like Russia or Brazil that did really poorly in the last uh, couple of years. But uh, I expect a continuation of that slowdown. You know, that, that's the bad news. The good news is the more extreme negative scenario. That would be my third scenario would be of a global recession. Mm. And I would say as long as US and China have a trade deal, as long as Brexit is soft as long as we don't have a war in the Middle East between US and Iran, and as long as central bank remain on hold in accommodative policies, probably currently the tail risk of an outright recession is relatively low. So then the question is why not to be more optimistic about uh, the global economy like scenario one, mm. and instead uh, believing in the scenario two of continuation of that global economic slowdown. You know, my view is based on a number of arguments. First of all, this argument that we're at the bottom of the slowdown doesn't to be uh, borne by the data. If you look at the data for Europe, for Germany, for China, for many emerging markets, yeah, things are not becoming worse, but they're not improving. And the US, maybe things are, are bottoming out. What are the key data out, uh, sets you look at, Nuriel, when you talk about not seeing those decelerations? Uh, you know, there are, first of all, coincident indicators of economic activity, like uh, current measures of employment, industrial production, retail sales, capex. But uh, forward-looking data, the various PMIs, ISMs, and so on, give you a sense of what's going on. And uh, one of the characteristics of 2019 was this uh, uh, significant collapse in global capital spending. CapEx was very sharply down. And of course, the reason for it was that there was an option value of waiting, given that you didn't know whether the trade wars between US and China and other ones are going to escalate or not. If you have to make major investments of billions of dollars in your factories and you don't know whether things are going to be improving or right. worsening, then you're, you're going to wait and see. And while a trade deal between US and China is likely, I think that's going to be a truce, a truce in a medium long term mm. a trade, a currency, technology, and even Cold War between US and China. And therefore, the sources of uncertainty that they keep CapEx down, in my view, are going to remain with us. I think that's an important uh, part of the story, I say. Second part of the story, in my view, is as I pointed out, if you look at the data around the world, we're not yet seeing a bottoming out of this uh, economic slowdown. It may be happening in the United States, but the data from many advanced economy emerging markets are not consistent with that. Uh, there may be a truce between US and China, but uh, we have geopolitical situations that might be having an adverse effect on a trade deal between US and China. We don't know whether there'll be a military crackdown in Hong Kong. We don't know whether China is going to react in a violent way uh, to say a pro-independence candidate winning uh, in the Taiwan elections and so on. So there are lots of geopolitical uncertainties that are going to be weighing on the market. And the problems of Europe are not just problems uh, related to Brexit, and now it looks like Brexit is going to be soft. You know, uh, you're running out of monetary stimulus option for the ECB. The country where fiscal space, like Germany and Netherlands, could do more but not doing more. Uh, there are fundamental problems of populism in Europe. Yes. Uh, there is political fragility in four of the key economies, Germany, France, Italy, and Spain, for different reasons, have political uncertainties. Uh, there is a risk of auto tariffs, and there is a glut of capacity in the auto sector. Mm. And uh, you know, economic reforms in Europe are occurring much more slowly 
than desirable and optimal, and therefore potential growth also with aging of population remains uh, limited. So I see a world in which while things are not gonna get worse, they're not gonna strengthen significantly in right. 2020. Now, the good news, there's not gonna be a recession. The bad news, we're gonna stay in a slowdown. The other good news is that central bank, of course, are gonna stay on hold. They're not gonna hike, they're not gonna ease more, most likely. And therefore, in that scenario, in a situation in which there is still a lot of debt in the world, public debt, private debt, in US, in Europe, in China, in the case of the US, I'm very concerned about the buildup of corporate debt, mm. whether it's leveraged loans, CLOs, fallen angel in the high grade, right. or the spreads on high yield being so compressed in spite of a buildup of leverage. Mm. I think there are fragility that are coming with excessive debt ratios that calls also imply something of a uh, surprise negatively that leads to a risk of episode and a correction of US and global equities. So, you know, my best scenario for 2020 for US equity will be that if you have uh, positive returns are gonna be in the low single digits as opposed to high single digits or double digits. Valuations, of course, are stretched. Uh, if you're looking at uh, Schiller Cape, sickly adjusted PE ratios. And there are also a wide range of political uncertainty related to the United States. You know, We'll see how this impeachment is gonna go. It's gonna be probably noise, markets are discounting it, but uh, that could be a source of tension. We'll see what happens with the nomination for the Democratic Party. It's possible that a progressive candidate might be nominated, and if that's the case, and if there's a chance that he or she might win the elections, then uh, most of these progressive candidates are coming with proposals for taxing more wealth, taxing more income, taxing more capital, right. taxing more w the rich. And you could see that the nomination of such a candidate may also be a trigger for a risk of episode and a correction in, uh, in US equities as well. So I would say the year is gonna be an okay year and a year probably in which after 20% plus returns for US equity this, uh, this past year, next year if you get uh, low single digits, you'll be, you'll be lucky and there are plenty of triggers of a potential risk of episode that could lead to a 10% correction some point during the year. So now that we, we have the base case and the way you see the world, I'm curious if we could go and unpack some of those things that you mentioned. So for example, central banks being on hold, policy has been remarkably accommodative for many, many years now, right? Mm -hmm. If you think about where we are with the federal funds rate, hundreds of basis points below the historical average. We have balance sheets all over the world at central banks, whether we're talking about the Fed, uh, the ECB, uh, there's a lot that they own. Um, so it's interesting when you say that they're on hold, what does it mean effectively to stay accommodative at the level that they're at and what influence can that have on asset prices and also on things like aggregate demand and potential for mispricing of assets? Well, the fact that they're accommodative has to do with the fact that there has been now a global slowdown, there is a risk that things will get even worse. And I think the easing of financial conditions that, uh, that additional accommodation has provided helps to avoid the tail risk of a a global recession is also the source of some of the asset inflation we've seen uh, you know, this year. I think that central banks most likely in my baseline scenario, even of a uh, continued slowdown, they're not gonna do more. You know, some of them actually cannot do much more. You know, ECB and BOJ and other central banks in the smaller parts of Europe are already with negative policy rates. They're reaching the limits of how negative they can go. They're doing various versions of quantitative and credit easing. They cannot do much more unless there is a severe recession. And of course, the Fed, with the economy doing okay, growing around 2%, is going mm -hmm. to stay on hold. You know, of course, the risk is that while the real economy with low growth and low inflation justifies this uh, accommodative uh, you know, monetary policy, that then you're going to create fraughtiness in financial market. And by some standards, US and some other risky assets, for example, real estate uh, is very expensive in many right. parts of the world. Credit, of course, uh, is very expensive with credit spreads being so low. Mm. Government bond yields are very low, and you could say government debt is also expensive. So we live in a world in which many risky assets, whether it's public equities, private equities, real estate, credit, government bonds are expensive. Of course, you need a major macro shock to trigger a significant, not just correction, but something worse than that. And of course, some risk off episodes may be occurring in the coming year. Tensions related to US and China, something to do with worries about uh, geopolitical tensions around the world. Uh, right. You know, the issue of 
all these excesses of corporate debt and re-leveraging and this and that. So I don't say we are in a bubble, but certainly we're in a period in which uh, asset markets are frothy, right. valuations are stretched, and therefore any macro shock can, can lead to a risk of episode, can lead to a correction, and that correction might remain persistent right. as opposed to being reversed. Uh, that's the risk we're facing right now. To have a recession, of course, you need a severe macro shock that is gonna be persistent over time. You know, one of the things I'm curious about, do you think in addition to the potential risk asset bubble, is, there, is it possible that we're seeing distortions, for example, in the financial system due to uh, the fact that interest rates have been priced far away from where a Taylor rule would suggest they should be? You know, we see things like compression of net interest margins in banks. Does that have the potential to have some sort of impact throughout the economy as well? Well, the distortion is that, of course, some of these valuations are excessive because uh, interest rates are so low, mm -hmm. both on the short end of the yield curve and on the longer end of the yield curve. And uh, say, you know, your negative, uh, not only policy rates, but uh, up to maturity of 10 years, you have about, depending on the week, uh, 10 to 12, 13 trillion dollars of uh, equivalent of government bonds uh, and even some corporate debt, right. not in US, but outside of US in Europe and Japan that have a, you know, a negative yield. So I think that we live in this dilemma that on one side, the real economy with low growth and low inflation justifies this very easy monetary policy. But on the other side, instead of goods inflation, we're having asset inflation. We may not be in a full scale bubble, but we are certainly in a situation in which, as I pointed out, for a wide range of asset classes, asset prices are too high, valuations are a bit stretched, and therefore the risk of a meaningful correction is, uh, is there as well. But you know, the dilemma is that uh, you know, the real economy justifies this accommodative monetary policy, including low inflation, but then the side effect and intended consequences of it might be asset inflation that eventually becomes asset frothiness right. and asset and eventually credit bubble. And we're building up the seeds of the next financial crisis with this buildup of excessive leverage, excessive risk taking, and excessive debt. As I pointed out in the US, is really concentrated, one, in the corporate sector and in the shadow banks. The you know officially regulated banks now because of the global financial crisis have more capital, less leverage, less risk taking, more liquidity. So they are okay. There's been some deleveraging also of the household sector, mm. but I would say the two sore points are corporate debt in US and also public debt. And of course, uh, the trillion dollar budget deficit is on a trajectory that eventually, of course, is not sustainable. Let's talk a little bit about corporate debt because that's something that's been getting a little bit of press the last six months. There have been people who have been speculating and worrying about this buildup in the corporate uh, sector, uh, especially in uh, in triple C and leveraged loans and CLOs and things like that. What's your take on that? How do you think about it? Well, if you look at measures of corporate debt as a share of you know GDP, are now back to all time highs. That's yeah. a signal. Uh, secondly, issuance of lots of types of uh, dangerous debt. Uh, has been increasing. And it's not just, of course, junk bonds or CLOs or leveraged loans, but uh, you have about half a trillion dollar of corporate debt in the high grade, these fallen angels, essentially. Those were really high grade and now are one step away from being downgraded uh, to junk bonds, given that there's been fragility in them. It's true that corporate profits have been quite robust. Earnings have been growing still fine. Uh, profit margins have been high. And if you take a measure of uh, debt of the corporate sector relative not to GDP, but earnings, things are better. And of course, in a world in which short rates are low and long rates are low, while the debt ratio may be high for the corporate sector, debt servicing ratios are also low and therefore allows even highly indebted firms to keep on borrowing more or to roll over their debts. However, you know, even in a world in which, say, treasury yields are below 2%, what can happen is that if there are concerns about the real economy, stall of growth, and so on, then you could have a spike in credit spreads. We've had you know, at least three major episodes of that happening in the last two or three years. You had the risk of episode in August, September of 2015. There were worries about uh, hard landing in China. There was another episode in January, February of 2016, uh, where there were worries both about Chinese and US hard landing, about collapse of oil prices, about the Fed tightening too much. And there was a third risk of episode in the fourth quarter of uh, last year, Q4 of 2018. Now, in each one of those episodes, while uh, bond deals on US Treasury were going lower and lower, 
because people are moving away from risky assets like equities into safe bonds, credit spreads were widening sharply. Say in the January, February of 2016 episode, uh, uh, high yield spreads went from 300 basis points of a treasury to 900. And if they had stayed at 900 for six months, that could have killed the economy, led to a recession. Luckily, uh, the Fed came to the uh, saving the markets. The right. worries about hard landing of US and China turned out to be wrong, and those spreads are narrowed again. Right. Or in Q4 of 2018, again, you had a total seizure of the CLO and leveraged loan market and so on. So even if uh, interest rates on safe assets may be low and falling more in a risk of credit spreads for the private sector or for risky sovereigns, like in some parts of the world, can blow up and therefore you could have the condition for, for, a, for a debt crisis. Of course, you need a macro trigger, like a sharp slowdown of growth that then leads to worries that there is a stall in profitability and then that those corporates and other agents that have high debt cannot more easily roll over their debts or borrow more. And then that's a trigger of the repricing of a risk premium. Mm -hmm. But we've seen those uh, credit spreads widening sharply and suddenly in a number of these episodes. And I think that whenever there's going to be another global macro shock, we're going to see a repeat of the same. So talking about central bank policy action, you are, of course, a keen watcher of the Fed and other central banks. What do you see right now when you look forward uh, at what's been happening over the last several months? Well, 2019 was a, a year where central banks, given the global headwinds, decided that uh, to ease more. The Fed cut cumulatively three times by 75 basis points. The ECB went slightly more negative and restarted uh, QE. Uh, Japan has not formally changed policy, but they already a negative policy rates. They do QE, they have a yield co curve control, and other smaller European countries have been either easing or signaling further easing. I think the question mark is not for 2020, because in the baseline scenario, which there's not a global recession, central banks are going to stay on hold. Uh, the Fed most likely is going to stay on hold through elections. And other central banks um, cannot do much more. You know, the ECB can go from minus 50 to minus 60, but then you reach a reversal rate. Uh, you know, you're already doing QE. I don't think you can buy much more than 20 billion uh, euro per month of bonds without eventually having a scarcity of boons. You know, the BOJ could go slightly more negative from minus 10 to minus 20. They're already doing YCC, they're already doing massive QE and so on. The question is what happens when you have uh, you know, the next recession and all the central banks are doing a review of their strategies, the Fed is doing it, the ECB is doing it and so on. Now, the, the attitude of the Fed so far is to say, if we have another recession, we're gonna hit the zero bound. And if we're gonna hit the zero bound, then we have to do other things. And what they're gonna do, they're comfortable with going back to forward guidance. They are comfortable with uh, going back to quantitative easing and credit easing, say buying again mortgage-backed security. So far, they're not comfortable about things that are slightly more heterodox, like going negative with a policy rate or having a control on the yield curve by targeting zero well, yields on the right longer end and so on. Spoke about so, that a couple of weeks ago. And yes. Exactly. So, so, but, uh, but so far the review doesn't include those more unconditional, unconventional tools as being part of the toolkit. I think that what's going to be happening when the next recession occurs is that um, the room, the headroom, is going to be limited. The Fed has only now 150 basis points of headroom. ECB and BOJ are already deeply in negative territory. Right. And uh, therefore, doing what has been done in the past, that is the usual unconventional, quantitative easing with negative rates is not going to be sufficient. And that's why I think that policies are going to become even more unconventional. Mm. And some variants of either modern monetary theory, some people call it MMT, mm. some people call it enhanced quantitative easing or uh, people's QE mm. or permanent monetization of uh, debt and deficits is what we're going to be seeing. First this is of all, very much a hot topic now, especially yeah. on the political left, where you see yeah. people talking about these mechanisms that are meant to, um, you know, effectively monetize debt. Yeah. What are your feelings about that? What are the implications? What are the risks? Yeah, you know, the ideas came from the left, of course, but uh, what has been happening is that actually in recent years, even mainstream people, you know, Ben Bernanke has spoken potentially positive about uh, helicopter drop of money. There's another way of speaking about MMT. Adai Turner was the 
head of the Financial Stability Authority in the UK, or even Stan Fisher and his uh, colleague at the BlackRock a few months ago have come up with an idea about former monetizing. Former vice chair of the Fed. Uh, former vice chair of the Fed come up with an idea on a temporary, uh, temporary monetization of fiscal deficits. I think people recognize, first of all, that fiscal policy is going to be necessary mm. when there is the next economic downturn because we're reaching the limit of what you can do with monetary policy. And secondly, if you issue more public debt and you don't monetize it, then long rates can go higher, and therefore there's some crowding out, and therefore that monetary fiscal easing has to be accompanied by monetary easing, uh, whether it's fully coordinated a la MMT or whether it's informally coordinated. Essentially, if you combine a fiscal stimulus with monetization of those deficits, and that effectively you have some variant of MMT or helicopter drop, or people's QE or the variant that Stan Fisher and others are speaking about. Now, you know, it's a controversial because on one side, some people have been critical, saying if you're doing monetization of fiscal deficits, you're going to end up into massive high inflation and the basement of the currency and devaluation. But, you know, if there is a slack in the economy, you're in a recession, there's slacks in goods and labor market, then all that extra money is not going to lead to inflation. So under those conditions of a depressed economic activity, of course, you can do variants of MMT and it boosts economic activity and aggregate demand. Well, it's interesting um, because on the other side of the coin, we, we heard about the risks of inflation prior to QE, prior to incredibly low interest rates yeah. and you know the velocity of money collapsed and there was yeah. never the inflation that was expected yeah. to come. So you do sort of wonder, will it really come now or not? Yeah, as I said, if we're in a situation which there is slack, like an extra recession, I think, Inflation is unlikely to come back. If anything, you'll have worries about deflation right. and all loflation. You know, inflation has been uh, low for a number of reasons. For a while, of course, there was significant slack in goods and labor market. There was this collapse, of course, of velocity, and therefore all that extra base money created by central bank was being hoarded in the form of excess reserves rather than putting, being put back at work, and therefore money did not cause inflation. Mm -hmm. But even now, we're in the US and some other parts of the world, we have reached something closer to uh, full employment, and there's not much slack in goods market. We're still in seeing inflation low. So the, probably there are also more structural reasons why inflation is low. Uh, whether it's trade, migration, globalization, that could be part of the story. Whether it's uh, workers are weak uh, mm. and unions are also weak in a world in which uh, unions have less power and uh, there's been shifting power from labor to capital for a number of reasons. Yes. Whether it's the gig economy, whether this Amazon effect that implies that there is less pricing power of traditional retailers. Right. Uh, so there are a whole bunch of reasons why the Phillips curve, both for wages and for prices, have become flatter right. and flatter, not on a temporary basis, but more of a permanent basis. So we live in a world in which actually, you know, inflation is likely to, to stay low. And therefore, when the next recession is going to hit, we'll have a tough choice on what to do. We'll have to go even more unconventional. You know, one of the things that's interesting is I, I regularly read your Project Syndicate column, and you've made the distinction between a depression in aggregate demand and a, a negative exogenous supply side shock as a cause of recession, and the different policy mechanisms that are required to address each of those. Could you talk a little bit about those distinctions and why they're so important in understanding global economies? Well, they're important because uh, the global financial crisis, you can think of it as being a major global aggregate demand shock right. and a collapse of animal spirits. And therefore, the policy response of uh, easing monetary policy, easing fiscal policy, so, bailing out uh, illiquid but solvent uh, agents uh, was the right one. Traditional Keynesian economics. Yeah, traditional Keynesian economics. Uh, what I have noticed, however, is that some of the tail risks that may have I hit the global economy in the next few years might not be aggregate demand shock, but a negative aggregate supply shock. Mm -hmm. If we're going to have restriction to trade because of US, China, or other protectionist policy by US or another country, that's a shock that reduces economic activity while increases also inflation, right. because the protection leads to higher cost of importing a variety of goods and services. If you're going to have a Brexit or other shocks that reduce potential growth, you have lower potential growth, and you're going to have a potentially higher cost because of the trade friction. Of course, if there was another oil shock because we go to war with Iran in the Middle East, like 73, like 79, like 1990, where global stagflationary shock, growth is going to be lower and uh, inflation is going to be higher. And of course, right. in a world in which there is a populist backlash, 
against trade, migration, globalization, even technology, economic policies are becoming more nationalistic, more inward, restricting migration, restricting trade, restricting FDI, and all these frictions are essentially equivalent to negative supply shocks, reduces growth, and rise inflation. That's now, very interesting because you've, you've just talked about the stagflation scenario, which is something yeah. that we haven't heard about for a very long time. In fact, our younger viewers yeah. probably won't remember this. You, you've had a, a great deal of history thinking about crises. You wrote a great book called Crisis Economics with Stephen Mim, where you, you looked at uh, crises going back to the South Sea bubble, the Mississippi Company. Um, and when people think about these supply side shocks, you think about things like the Suez Crisis, the Yom Kippur War in 70 the 79 revolution. We haven't experienced anything even remotely like that causing stagflation in the U.S. Is that really a risk if these scenarios play out? Well, if some of these uh, negative supply shocks were to materialize, certainly you'll have a negative impact on growth. Certainly deglobalization or fragmentation of the global economy or balkanization is going to imply that say a global supply chain in tech, in manufacturing industries are gonna be creating frictions, gonna be increasing cost, and therefore you'll have a negative supply shock that increases prices and reduces growth. So now the short-term response to this risk of central bank and also fiscal policy has been easing for a number of reasons. Uh, reason number one is that compared to the 70s, inflation and inflation expectations are low. Mm -hmm. So the risk of a unhankering upward is still relatively low. Two, uh, some of these shocks might lead to a price level effect rather than a sustained increase in inflation. So some central banks can look through it. And three, while there are aggregate supply shocks, there are also aggregate demand shocks. Mm. At the same time, the collapse of CapEx because of, say, uh, you know, the option value of waiting, right. or if there is going to be protectionism, import prices go higher, and consumers are going to have a reduction in real disposal income, they're going to consume less. And therefore, in the short run, the right policy response, of course, is to have monetary and fiscal easing. What I point out is that if these shocks are not transitory, but they're permanent, mm. they're going to permanently reduce growth and increase potentially prices, then the right response is not monetary and fiscal easing, because if you do monetary and fiscal easing, like in the 70s, mm. you may end up eventually with runaway inflation and with unsustainable fiscal deficit and debt. And instead, the right policy will be to not accommodate them, but to adjust. You know, if Brexit occurs, potential growth uh, in UK is lower. And with potential growth, uh, you cannot stimulate the economy as much. If we're gonna have a full-scale trade and tech war between US and China, uh, global growth is gonna be lower potentially. And if you ease monetary policy, you're not gonna be able to resolve a negative permanent supply shock with monetary and fiscal stimulus. And if you right. try to do so eventually, not in the short term, you might have also upward the inflationary pressure in spite of these structural factors that are keeping inflation low in the short run. Yeah, I mean, talking of structural factors, we've also had a dramatic increase in domestic energy production here in the U.S. that may offset it, and as prices rise, it will become more economical to extract here in the U.S. at higher price points. So does that have an impact on the ability to weather a shock from, uh, from, from effectively an energy shock from importing? Well, it's true that, you know, that compared to the 70s, uh, our reliance on energy in production and consumption is lower structurally. And we have now shale gas and oil that uh, effectively uh, reduces the impact of a negative supply shock. But I would make the following caveat. First of all, many other parts of the world are net uh, oil importers in Europe. Uh, in Turkey, in India, in China, in many emerging markets in Japan. So a shock that increases oil prices above $100 per barrel is going to negatively impact the rest of the world. Secondly, even in the United States, where on net, still a net energy importer, we're not yet a net energy exporter, so the overall impact uh, of a oil shock is negative. And there is the distributional effects, you know, oil producers or energy producers are going to be better off, their profits are going to go higher, but they're not going to do much more production or investment, while the impact is going to be very negative on consumers of oil, starting with households. You know, if you have oil above a $100 barrel because of geopolitical risk in the Middle East, uh, and you have gasoline prices at 4 to $6 a gallon, then the impact negatively on real disposable income and consumption is bigger than any positive impact that comes uh, on oil producers from that uh, oil shock. So the distribution effect implies that it's still a negative aggregate demand shock for the U.S. economy. So 
We cannot be so blasé about it and say, because we produce so much oil, it's not going to impact us. The distributional effects could be significant. Households are going to be worse off, and that could be a tipping point for a slowdown in consumption, because the only thing that's been holding, holding the economy going, with CapEx being so weak, has been private consumption. So right. either an oil shock or a protectionist shock may be the tipping point for private consumption. And potentially another collapse in demand. Yeah, that, that's a risk. Uh, shift gears a little bit. One of the things that caught my attention uh, in September was the dislocations in the repo market. Could you talk a little bit about the importance of the repo market, what function it serves, and what you think might have caused those massive spikes in rates? Yeah, I mean, what has happened? Of course, the repo market is important because uh, effectively more than the Fed funds rate market right now, financial institutions, not just commercial banks, but also shadow banks rely on the repo market for their needs of liquidity and lending money and so on. Um, I think part of what has happened was that the Federal Reserve, when it started its policy of quantitative tightening, believed that actually the amount of excess reserves that were needed in the system were lower than otherwise, and that quantitative tightening, allowing essentially the roll-off of maturing debt, implied there was a shrinkage of, uh, of excess reserves. And then you have suddenly a situation in which uh, there is a demand for reserves. Mm -hmm. So when the corporate sector at the end of a quarter needs a lot of cash, to pay taxes or other situation of that sort. And the other thing has happened is then, of course, a number of shadow banks, including hedge funds, have been using a repo market as a way of borrowing money, as a way of then going uh, into a variety of carry trades. You borrow short low in order to make risk investment. So that demand, the repo market for liquidity has had spikes that are cyclical and structural, right. and the supply of essential liquidity was limited. That's why the Fed is worrying about a similar shock occurring again towards the end of the year. I would say that since the Fed has gone aggressively towards uh, providing uh, liquidity and increasing its balance sheet again, most likely these problems are gonna be uh, contained. So we talked a little bit about China earlier and there's a lot yeah. to unpack. There was potential for a currency war, a trade war, uh, effectively balkanization of the technology infrastructure. There's a lot going on. You've written about China as a potential Thucydides trap. Could you talk a little bit about what your view is in that context and what that means? Yeah, in my view, the strategic rivalry between US and China is gonna stay with us for a long period of time. You know, I remember about four years ago in November of uh, 2015, I was uh, with a delegation in Beijing. We had the honor of meeting President Xi Jinping in the great hall of the people just off Tiananmen Square. And uh, this was actually a year before Trump was elected. He spent the first 10 minutes speaking formally, specifically about you know the two cities trap. You now, for those who don't know it, uh, two cities was the great uh, Greek historian that essentially wrote the history of why a rising Athens, a new rising power facing an existing power, uh, Sparta led to war between Athens and Sparta. And uh, that term now has become uh, essentially a, a code name for a situation which have a rising power facing an existing power. Graham Allison. And, and, and Graham Allison from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, two years later, wrote uh, the famous book now, mm. Destined to War, Will the US and China Avoid it to See the this Trap? Now, what Xi Jinping was telling us was that the rise of China will be peaceful, and therefore we shouldn't worry about it to see this trap. But guess what? We're now two years later where we're in the middle of a trade war, a currency war, a technology war, and broader cold war. You know, Alison pointed out that in 12 out of 16 cases, when you have a rising power facing existing one, there is a hot war. I don't think in the case of US and China, we're gonna have a hot war, even if there are strategies both in Beijing and Washington are thinking about those tail risks. But certainly the risk of a of a cold war between US and China, I think it's a rising risk. And it's important because for the last uh, you know, 40 years or so, since uh, 1979, when China opened up the world with the reforms of Deng Xiaoping, or since 1989, when we had the collapse of the Soviet Union and the fall of the Berlin Wall, we have been in a process of greater globalization, more trading goods and services and capital and labor in technology and data and information. And instead, if these uh, collision course between US and China will occur, will be at the beginning of deglobalization, of decoupling, of fragmentation, of, uh, you know, balkanization. And just to give you an example, you know, today US is worried about uh, the 5G of Huawei and having a backdoor to the Chinese government. Right. And of course, those 5G networks are not gonna uh, 
are going to control our telecom and our cell phones in the next few years. But you know, in the next few years, once we have autonomous vehicles, we need a 5G system to make sure that millions of cars uh, that are autonomous don't hit each other. But you know, a few years from now, every piece of consumer electronic, even a coffee machine or a a toaster or even a microwave is going to have a 5G chip. So if you believe that China is listening to our devices using microphones and drones and whatever not, they can do so also with a coffee machine or with a toaster. And therefore, if you're going to have a technology war, eventually the technology war becomes a, a trade war. And therefore, I think we are going that direction. And if you look at all the data, we are already in a process of decoupling between US and China. We sit in the trade side, we sit in FDI, with Chinese FDI, in the world has collapsed or in, towards the US has collapsed by 90%. Mm. In the last couple of years, we see it in movements of talent where now people worry in the US that every Chinese researcher or every student might be potentially suspicious or a spy, whatever. Right. We see it in a variety of other uh, technological areas where clearly China wants to achieve its strategic dominance in the industries of the future, where there is AI, telecom, uh, quantum computing, biotech, electric vehicles, uh, autonomous vehicles, and the U.S. now sees China as being a strategic rival of the United States, and therefore these uh, tension between the two powers on who's going to dominate the technology of the future can imply restriction of movements of technology. So we see that across the spectrum. I mean, give a couple of recent example, even restriction of data information, you know, there is this dating app for gay people that was purchased uh, recently by a Chinese media firm. And now the US is asking uh, China or this Chinese firm to divest from it because the worry is that some people that say in the closet might be subject to blackmail if you have control on their data. Or people now are worried that maybe TikTok might be used as a way of essentially getting data about what uh, US teenagers are doing. There are even some ideas about making sure that even TikTok is divested from a Chinese owner. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a restriction in trading goods, in services, right. in capital, in labor, but also technology, information, right. and data. So across the board, we are in a process of deglobalization and decoupling within US and China. It's going to occur slowly over time, and a trade truce is going to postpone some of it until after the US election. But I think the medium-term trend is deglobalization and decoupling. I mean, the scope of the problem that you just described is absolutely enormous, right? If you think about the size of the bilateral trade relationship, and then you talk about these technology issues that were things we didn't even think about as recently yep. as five years ago, it's an extraordinary degree of coupling uh, technologically, economically, um, you know, all of the diplomatic and, and uh, Asia-Pacific uh, military uh, issues. I mean, it is an extraordinary problem. Are you ultimately optimistic about it, pessimistic about it? Do you think we just blunder forward for a while? I mean, it almost feels as though there has to be a resolution or there has to be conflict, or is that too simple of a way to look at it? Well, I don't believe in a hot war, but there is certainly a risk of a cold war between US and China. Yeah. Um, some people are more pessimistic to think of a sheer Cold War and just strategic uh, you know, competition between these two major powers. Other people are more constructive, say the right. former Prime Minister of Australia, Kevin Rudd, who's an expert of China, yes. says that we should have managed strategic competition between US and China so that we compete in some dimensions and we right. cooperate in others. Other people have a variant that use the term competition, where there is competition in some dimensions and cooperation in other ones. I think that one important point is going to be Europe, because of course, you know, the US and China are going to say either you're with us or you're against us, either my 5G or their 5G, my right. AI or their AI. I think that maybe Europe can have an important role in making sure there is still an international economic order where you follow some rules, even if there is competition in some strategic dimension and we don't have a destruction right. of the international economic order that we created with the WTO, the IMF, the World Bank, mm -hmm. the UN, NATO after World War II. So it could escalate in a full-scale yeah. Cold War, or it could be something where you compete and you cooperate on some dimensions. I don't think that the outcome of it is very clear for now. And that conversation has already begun, for example, in the UK with using uh, data infrastructure for, for, for 5G. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting, you were talking about World War II, and I was thinking back to World War I, the notion of the Guns of August scenario, that it was a, the Europe had become so economically integrated that it was simply impossible that a hot war could take place. And I suppose the, the message is that we should never take for granted that positive outcomes will occur and we should never stop to attempt to solve these problems. 
Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, people make mistakes, and if you're in a mindset where you're fearing the other side, yes, then you can end up into a self-fulfilling situation, which things escalate in a full-scale uh, cold war or something uh, worse than that. Therefore, you know, leadership matters. You know, you need both in U.S. and in China and in Europe leaders that make sure that some semblance of the international economic order that gave us peace and prosperity for the last 70 years stay with us. If we're going to go in the direction of a full-scale uh, trade and Cold War, the economic damage is going to be huge. You know, when there was the first Cold War between U.S. and Soviet Union, U.S. and Soviet Union were doing barely any trade, a little bit of oil, a little bit of wheat, and so on. Right. But you know, there is such an integration of U.S. and China and global supply chains from Asia to Europe and so on, that that decoupling is going to be much more of a negative supply shock for the global economy, let alone the geopolitical implication of it. But finding the right uh, balance within cooperating and competing is going to require leaders that have the long-term view of how to manage this complicated relation because of all the geopolitical issues of our time, how to manage the rise of China and make sure it doesn't lead to conflict is going to be the most important geopolitical issues uh, for the next decades to come. Do you have any confidence that we see leadership in the United States either presently or on the horizon that understands the complexity and scope of these problems? Um, one can be only hopeful that, uh, you know, there'll be changes politically in the U.S. Uh, so that we have actually leadership, you know, uh, you know, China is rising. Mm -hmm. If China is rising, you need to have a strategy towards Asia. The first thing that, say, Trump did when he came to power in the first week was to pull out of TPP. You know, mm -hmm. at least uh, Obama had a strategy, China is rising, there's a pivot uh, of the U.S. towards Asia, yes. and that pivot cannot be just sending a few Marines to Australia, there has to be an economic lag, and the economic lag was TPP to make sure that the right. ASEAN country and the ASEAN Pacific countries stay in the economic orbit of the United States. Well, you know, Trump pulled the plug on that one, and the economic pillar of maintaining that uh, strategic role in Asia has disappeared. So unless you have a vision about how you engage your allies in Asia, uh, and you have to engage them and you have to support them, whether it's Korea, whether it's Japan, whether it's the other ASEAN countries, or otherwise they're gonna end up into the economic and then political and geopolitical orbit of China. So you need a strategy. But that probably implies having uh, leaders in the U.S. that have that vision about how, in a constructive way, you engage uh, China. It cannot be containment; it's to be engaging the allies of the United States in Europe, in the rest of the world, in Asia. So make sure that the economic liberal system remains an economic liberal system. So Kennan's doctrine from the Cold War will not suffice. We need more engaged leadership. Absolutely. So you know. Uh, Soviet Union was a declining power, and therefore containing it eventually led to collapse of the Soviet Union. With all its flaws, China is a rising power. You know, even if potential growth has fallen, it's going to be at least uh, four to five percent for the next uh, few years. And if you try to contain China as opposed to engage it, the risk is that China is going to become more aggressive. So. It's a much bigger challenge to manage a relationship with China than it was with the Soviet Union. Mm. And if you make stupid mistakes, then uh, it could escalate into something which some of the conflicts, both economic, financial, but also military and geopolitical, could become tense. In Asia, of course, there are tension on Taiwan, in Hong Kong, the East China Sea, the South China Sea. All these things are, are important, having leaders in the West who know how to engage China to push back on certain things, but engage it in others is going to be uh, so absolutely key. And very, so com what? very complicated potential military flashpoints in the South China Sea around the shipping lanes. Yeah, absolutely so. And one should recognize that, you know, that some of the issues of China are legitimate. You know, any power that becomes a major economic, trading, and financial power also has to flex is also military and geopolitical power. You know, China is worried that since they are importing commodities and materials from all over the world, they have to have some insurance that the shipping lanes like the Strait of Malacca are mm -hmm. going to remain open. So yes. the fact that China has a blue water navy right now doesn't have to be seen as aggressive. could be purely defensive. But that's where there is a source for miscalculation. What they think as defensive, we can think of it as being aggressive, and then things can escalate. Guns of August again. Yep. So obviously we're coming into a 2020 election cycle. Um, one of the things that's coming up quite a great deal is, is the rise of populism, issues of economic inequality. What's your view of that? Yes, throughout the world we're seeing these uh, populist backlash against trade, against globalization, against migration, uh, against supranational authority, even against technological innovation may be threatening 
jobs and uh, opportunity. And uh, this is happening, I would say, not just in, you know, in advanced economies, you know, the election of Trump uh, in the US or, uh, you know, Brexit in the UK or the rise of the political power of some uh, populist uh, parties of extreme right or left uh, in some part of Europe. But you also see, you know, authoritarian strongmen uh, uh, becoming entrenched in power in many emerging market economies. You know, you have Putin in Russia, you have Erdogan in Turkey, uh, you have Orban uh, in Hungary, you have Maduro in Venezuela, you have Bolsonaro in Brazil, Duterte in the Philippines, uh, and you know, Xi Jinping is also an authoritarian leader, mm. and even Modi in India has some authoritarian streaks, so there is even a, a threat uh, you know, to liberal democracy. Now, what, what's happened, uh, I think, is in part uh, concerns that are economic, and then there are also concerns about identity, social, cultural, religious, ethnic identity. Mm. On the economic side of it, I think that uh, the lesson we've learned that was known to every economy is that while trade and globalization migration increases the economic pie, uh, there are also distributional effects. Right. Some people benefit out of it, some people don't benefit as much of it. There are winners and there are losers, that those who are gonna go ahead and those are gonna be those that are left behind. And unfortunately, whether it's trade or globalization or migration or technology, there are plenty of people that are left behind, yes. that are struggling, you know. And it's not just trade and migration, you know. In the future, of course, uh, technological innovation AI is gonna threaten jobs and incomes and entire firms and industries. And therefore, these distributional effects have to be addressed. Uh, you have to make sure that, you know, globalization and digitalization doesn't leave people behind and it makes it successful for most people. Otherwise, the populist backlash is going to become more extreme. You've written about this devastating trinity from AI specifically and technology more generally, uh, that it's effectively labor-saving, capital-biased, and skills-biased, yeah. which effectively yeah. uh, serves to be a, a pro-cyclical, I guess, effect for uh, income inequality. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, income inequality has been rising. Uh, initially, it was a story about trade, migration, and globalization, mm -hmm. but technological innovation, the skill bias, labor saving, uh, implies that, you know, if you have capital, you're gonna do well. Mm -hmm. If you are in the top 20, 30% of distribution of skills, you're gonna do well. But if you are low skill labor, not just blue collars, but increasingly even white collar jobs are gonna be yes. threatened by technology, then your income and your jobs are gonna be threatened by this technological innovation. Right. And I think part of the risk is we may be fighting uh, the last war. You know, Trump is worried right now about the implication of trade and you know migration for jobs and income, but make the following thought experiment. Suppose that we had a big wall all over the US and nobody can get in. Suppose we had 100% tariffs and we're not importing anything from the rest of the world. In the next five to 10 to 15 years, uh, the job disruption is gonna occur through technology. I don't know whether it takes 10 or 15 years until we have say right. autonomous vehicle, but you have uh, millions of uh, Uber drivers or millions of truck drivers, the Teamsters, right. And those jobs are gonna be gone, and those right. jobs have nothing to do with trade and they have nothing to do with migration. Right. So even if you, unquote, uh, have a big wall and you have tariffs, technology is gonna disrupt many more jobs and incomes and entire firms and industries more than trade and globalization. And we have to think about solutions about those problems. Otherwise, the rise in inequality is gonna come from technology and these other forces of globalization is gonna lead to an even bigger backlash against globalization. You know, it's extraordinary. It's something that's been happening, in, you know, in blue collar jobs for decades. And, and now it seems that, uh, you know, people who live in cities and read the New York Times are concerned about it because they realize that their jobs are being outsourced or there's this unusual shift that's happening with jobs that were previously outsourced have now been sort of parameterized and structured in a way that they can be fed into computers. Uh, for example, uh, law. My job, for example, uh, we have increasingly stories being written about financial and economic data by machines. Uh, and it seems as though the potential opportunities to displace labor with technology are virtually limitless. They are limitless. And um, what has happened that is different from right the past is that, uh, you know, with the first, second, and third industrial revolution, we move labor from primary agriculture to manufacturing, then from manufacturing to services. Mm -hmm. But now many of the service jobs are also threatened by technology. Uh, two, the speed at which these things are occurring is much more rapid than the past, and therefore the disruptions are gonna be 
uh, severe. And, and as you point out, you know, for every job created, say, by Amazon, there may be 10 other retail jobs that are disappearing. Right. And now a whole bunch of services, financial services through fintech are going to be subject to large amount of automation, payment system, right. credit allocation, robot advisors, asset management, insurance, uh, transportation with uh, autonomous vehicles going to be disrupted. You know, media is being disrupted, legal firms are disrupted, audit firms are disrupted. So even good jobs that are white collar, middle upper income can be disrupted by technology. So it's really a right. much more sweeping process that's going to be highly disruptive in the future. You know, and that leads us right back to economic populism here in the United States. We look at some of the field in the Democratic Party talking about things like universal basic income uh, and wealth taxes uh, and some other things that wouldn't have been on the table as recently as four years ago. What's your view about those? Are they things that could potentially be helpful or are they just destructive in that they're going to create economic dislocation? Well, we need to do something to help those who are left behind. I would say the first best policy will be to provide the skills, the human capital, the tools, the re-education to make sure that everybody survives and thrives in a globalized digital economy. Uh, it's easier said than done. Not everybody can become a venture capitalist or entrepreneur. Some people will, but some people are not going to be able to do so. So if people are going to be left behind, then I think the other thing is to have a broader social safety net. You know, right. if you cannot have the same job for life and you have to hop from one job to another, you have to make sure that if it's bad luck rather than uh, your own kind of characteristic that led you to lose a job, you have enough unemployment benefit and reskilling, you have enough health care, you have enough uh, other things that are going to be pensions and others are going to make sure that then you can move from point A to B to C. That's going to be part of the solution to try, like in the Nordic model, to help jobs rather than protecting specific, uh, you know, jobs. So right. you, you need to, to have that uh, new type of a social safety net. Paradoxically, you need a wider social safety net mm. to make sure people are more flexible because if there is not a social safety net, people are going to resist globalization and technology. They right. can make sure that then they, if they lose a job, they can move to other ones and there is a safety net then they're going to be more flexible. And if all these things are not going to be sufficient, of course, uh, some variants of universal basic income might be part of the solution. But all this solution essentially implies that the economic pie becomes bigger, but the distribution of it becomes more unequal because owner of physical and financial capital do better, those that are skilled workers are doing better, and everybody else is left behind. So you have the, the margin to tax the winners and right. then redistribute uh, stuff to to those who are left behind. You can redistribute it as income and subsidy. You can do it as a provision of public services that are essentially free, uh, like healthcare, education, reskilling, and so on. Or you can do it in different ways, but we're gonna probably have to move towards a more progressive system of taxation and try to make sure that those that are left behind are less left behind. Mm. I was curious about the Nordic model because these are very small homogeneous countries and how do you administer something like that on the scale of you know, 330 million Americans living in diverse regions and different you know, regional economies? It's an interesting question. Yeah, and you're right that they are much more homogeneous society, even less so than the past given mm -hmm. migration. But you know, the, the idea that uh, you should protect uh, workers rather than specific jobs, I think is an in principle that can be applied anywhere. You know, if an industry or a firm, uh, because of technology of trade, is disappearing, uh, propping it up is not be sufficient, keeping the same job, but, but you want popular. to make sure that the workers have enough to be able to survive and then move to something else. So the concept can be applied even to a large economy like the United States. And we do have the fiscal resources, if the economic pie becomes bigger, to tax those who are successful, to try to help those who are left behind. Does it involve changing the structure of the tax system, meaning uh, is it sufficient to simply increase things like corporate taxes, some you know, marginal percentage uh, income taxes, or is it, in your view, going to take something like taxing wealth, as some have suggested? Well, you know, whether you tax wealth or you tax uh, more uh, the income uh, of high-income mm -hmm. individuals, or whether you tax slightly more capital and less labor. Right. You know, there are pros and cons about doing it uh, for wealth as opposed to income, as opposed to capital income versus labor income. Right. But I think the basic principle is the economic pie becomes bigger. 
Some people are winners, some people are left behind. Right. Those who are left behind eventually is going to cause economic and social and political instability. And then you have to tax those who are winners to provide either public services or income or subsidies to the other ones to maintain an economic balance. Even from a point of view of economic growth, leaving aside the political instability, if there is too much redistribution of income from labor to capital, from wages to profits, mm. you're transferring income from those who have a marginal propensity to spend to those who have a high marginal propensity to save. So right. these concerns about the secular stagnation might be in part due to the rise of inequality. You know, Karl Marx had this view that uh, capitalism is going to self-destruct because as profits become larger and wages become lower, you're going to have this theory of underconsumption. And I think some of the weakness we've seen in the last few years has been driven by this rise in inequality. For a while, we could uh, paper it over by people keeping up with the Joneses by borrowing against uh, you know, their housing wealth. And that's why we got the global financial crisis. But now we have the same kind of a dismal income prospects and people cannot borrow like the past. So we have to find much more fundamental solutions to this problem of underconsumption. Otherwise, you'll have both economic and political instability. Marx was much better at diagnosis than prescription, wasn't he? <laughs> he was, but certainly <laughs> the diagnosis that there are some potential fundamental problem in capitalism can be addressed, you know, happened. But, you know, even after the first and the second uh, industrial revolution, there was the same squeeze on wages and on labor income. And uh, those countries that had uh, benevolent, I would say, capitalists who realized that uh, you're going to have eventually revolutions like in Russia and China. In the West, we created a social welfare system, uh, free education, health care, unemployment benefits, workers' rights, and other things that increase actually uh, incomes of the workers that maintain social and economic uh, stability. And that's why that kind of a mixed economy, market economy, with a welfare system led to a change of capitalist societies that maintain them successful and stable. And we're having the same challenge right now. Either we reform capitalism to make it work for everybody, or eventually you'll have uh, either revolutions or civil wars or political instability. That's, that's a story of the past. So perhaps it's in continuity that the Silicon Valley potentates are looking at things uh, as modern day Henry Ford's, perhaps things such as universal basic income and other schemes to democratize education and do other things that would be pro-social progressive. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're resisting, however, being taxed more. I think mm -hmm. they will have a backlash against uh, big tech, not only because of its economic power, but also uh, because of, you know, everybody has to pay a fair share of, of the tax system. And that's not happening, especially, you know, in the, in the tech sector, in part because of offshoring and so on. So, so we'll, we'll need to have a different tax system where those who are winners are paying a fairer share of, uh, of the taxes as well. And also the different tax treatment for private equity versus ordinary gains. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So Nuriel, here we are in December. As we head into 2020, what are you gonna be looking for specifically? As I pointed out, uh, there are a variety of scenarios. I'm more confident that we're gonna continue with this uh, global economic slowdown, but optimists say we're gonna have reflation and expansion. And the pessimists, of course, are going to look at potential for shocks that are going to lead to a recession. I think that the key things to look for the next few months are going to be, one, what happens with uh, US and China, mm. how much there is a real truce and an improved uh, trade and tech relation, as opposed to a truce that leads then to an escalation of a technology war. Are there any specific indicators you're looking for in that particular outcome? Well, the specific one will be that while there'll be a truce on trade, I fear that this uh, uh, technology war between US and China is gonna mm -hmm. escalate. The US may take various types of legislations or regulatory restrictions that restricts further, for example, what China can do in the United States. There is a new proposal that the Commerce Department may have the right to block any uh, technology comes from abroad that is coming from a foreign adversary that will create a whole new system of bureaucracy mm. equivalent to CFU. So the technology mm. space, I think, is a very important one. Uh, regardless of the results of the UK elections, uh, whether it's going to be a true process of negotiation that leads to a soft uh, uh, Brexit as opposed to a contentious relation between the UK and Europe is going to be something to monitor. I think that the tensions in the Middle East still can explode. I don't know whether Iran can stay for another year under these very severe sanctions mm. uh, imposed on them without doing something like escalating some of the friction that lead then to a military attack by the United States, and that could escalate. 
uh, certainly. And um, we're going to also look at what happens to, to Europe, how much of a political tensions are going to continue to occur in Germany, in France, in Italy, and Spain, that are four important key Eurozone economies, and whether the Trump policies on trade lead to a escalation just not with China, but also with other parts of the world. Are we going to have a, a trade war on technology and digital taxation uh, with Europe? Are we going to impose uh, taxes and tariffs on uh, European exports of cars? And there are lots of other things can happen on the trade uh, protectionist side as well. So landscape fraught yeah. with quite a bit of peril. Absolutely. And hopefully some of those tail risks are not going to be materialized, in which case uh, maybe the slowdown occurs without the recession or maybe growth could pick up slightly stronger than otherwise in a more positive scenario. I love ending on a positive note. Yes. Thank you for joining us, Nuriel. Great being with you today. Cheers.